1984, Part 2, Chapter 4. Winston looked round the shabby little room above Mr. Charrington's shop. Beside the window the enormous bed was made up, with ragged blankets and a coverless bolster. The old-fashioned clock with the twelve-hour face was ticking away on the mantelpiece. In the corner, on the gate-leg table, the glass paperweight, which he had bought on his last visit, gleamed softly out of the half-darkness. In the fender was a battered tin oil stove, a saucepan and two cups provided by Mr. Charrington. Winston lit the burner and set a pan of water to boil. He had brought an envelope full of victory coffee and some saccharin tablets. The clock's hands said 7.20. It was 19.20 really. She was coming at 19.30. Folly, folly, his heart kept saying. Conscious, gratuitous, suicidal folly. Of all the crimes that a party member could commit, this one was the least possible to conceal. Actually, the idea had first floated into his head in the form of a vision of the glass paperweight mirrored by the surface of the gate-leg table. As he had foreseen, Mr. Charrington had made no difficulty about letting the room. He was obviously glad of the few dollars that it would bring him. Nor did he seem shocked or become offensively knowing when it was made clear that Winston wanted the room for the purpose of a love affair. Instead, he looked into the middle distance, and spoke in generalities, with so delicate an air as to give the impression that he had become partly invisible. Privacy, he said, was a very valuable thing. Everyone wanted a place where they could be alone occasionally. And when they had such a place, it was only common courtesy in anyone else who knew of it to keep his knowledge to himself. He even, seeming almost to fade out of existence as he did so, added that there were two entries to the house, one of them through the backyard, which gave on an alley. Under the window somebody was singing. Winston peeped out, secure in the protection of the muslin curtain. The June sun was still high in the sky, and in the sun-filled court below a monstrous woman, solid as a Norman pillar, with brawny red forearms and a sacking apron strapped about her middle, was stumping to and fro between a wash tub and a clothesline, pegging out a series of square white things which Winston recognised as baby's diapers. Whenever her mouth was not corked with clothes pegs, she was singing in a powerful contralto. It was only an hopeless fancy, it passed like an April dye. But a look and a word and the dreams they stirred, they have stolen my art a why. The tune had been haunting London for weeks past. It was one of countless similar songs published for the benefit of the proles by a subsection of the music department. The words of these songs were composed without any human intervention whatever on an instrument known as a versificator. But the woman sang so tunefully as to turn the dreadful rubbish into an almost pleasant sound. He could hear the woman singing and the scrape of her shoes on the flagstones and the cries of the children in the street and somewhere in the far distance a faint roar of traffic, and yet the room seemed curiously silent, thanks to the absence of a telescreen. Folly, 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 he thought again. It was inconceivable that they could frequent this place for more than a few weeks without being caught. But the temptation of having a hiding place that was truly their own, indoors and near at hand, had been too much for both of them. For some time after their visit to the church belfry, it had been impossible to arrange meetings. Working hours had been drastically increased in anticipation of hate week. It was more than a month distant, but the enormous 
complex preparations that it entailed were throwing extra work onto everybody. Finally, both of them managed to secure a free afternoon on the same day. They had agreed to go back to the clearing in the wood. On the evening beforehand, they met briefly in the street. As usual, Winston hardly looked at Julia as they drifted towards one another in the crowd, but from the short glance he gave her, it seemed to him that she was paler than usual. It's all off, she murmured as soon as she judged it safe to speak. Tomorrow, I mean. What? Tomorrow afternoon. I can't come. Why not? Oh, the usual reason. It started early this time. For a moment he was violently angry. During the month that he had known her, the nature of his desire for her had changed. At the beginning, there had been little true sensuality in it. Their first lovemaking had been simply an act of the will. But after the second time it was different. The smell of her hair, the taste of her mouth, the feeling of her skin seemed to have got inside him, or into the air all round him. She had become a physical necessity, something that he not only wanted, but felt that he had a right to. When she said that she could not come, he had the feeling that she was cheating him. But just at this moment, the crowd pressed them together, and their hands accidentally met. She gave the tips of his fingers a quick squeeze that seemed to invite not desire, but affection. It struck him that when one lived with a woman, this particular disappointment must be a normal, recurring event, and a deep tenderness, such as he had not felt for her before, suddenly took hold of him. He wished that they were a married couple of ten years standing. He wished that he were walking through the streets with her just as they were doing now, but openly and without fear, talking of trivialities and buying odds and ends for the household. He wished, above all, that they had some place where they could be alone together without feeling the obligation to make love every time they met. It was not actually at that moment, but at some time on the following day, that the idea of renting Mr. Charrington's room had occurred to him. When he suggested it to Julia, she had agreed with unexpected readiness. Both of them knew that it was lunacy. It was as though they were intentionally stepping nearer to their graves. As he sat waiting on the edge of the bed, he thought again of the cellars of the Ministry of Love. It was curious how that predestined horror moved in and out of one's consciousness. There it lay, fixed in future time, preceding death as surely as ninety-nine precedes a hundred. One could not avoid it, but one could perhaps postpone it, and yet instead, every now and again, by a conscious, willful act, one chose to shorten the interval before it happened. At this moment there was a quick step on the stairs. Julia burst into the room. She was carrying a tool bag of coarse brown canvas, such as he had sometimes seen her carrying to and fro at the ministry. He started forward to take her in his arms, but she disengaged herself, rather hurriedly, partly because she was still holding the tool bag. Half a second, she said. Just let me show you what I've brought. Did you bring some of that filthy victory coffee? I thought you would. You can chuck it away again, because we shan't be needing it. Look here. She fell on her knees, threw open the bag, and tumbled out some spanners and a screwdriver that filled the top part of it. Underneath was a number of neat paper packets. The first packet that she passed to Winston had a strange and yet vaguely familiar feeling. It was filled with some kind of heavy, sand-like stuff, which yielded wherever you touched it. It isn't sugar, he said. Real sugar, not saccharin, sugar. And here's a loaf of bread, proper white bread, not our bloody stuff, and a little pot of jam. And here's a tin of milk. But look, this is the one I'm really proud of. I had to wrap a bit of sacking round it because, 
that she did not need to tell him why she had wrapped it up. The smell was already filling the room, a rich hot smell which seemed like an emanation from his early childhood, but which one did occasionally meet with even now, blowing down a passageway before a door slammed, or diffusing itself mysteriously in a crowded street, sniffed for an instant and then lost again. It's coffee, he murmured. Real coffee. It's in a party coffee. There's a whole kilo here, she said. How did you manage to get hold of all these things? It's all in a party stuff. There's nothing those swine don't have. Nothing. But of course, waiters and servants and people pinch things. And look, I got a little packet of tea as well. Winston had squatted down beside her. He tore open a corner of the packet. It's real tea, not blackberry leaves. There's been a lot of tea about lately. They've captured India or something, she said vaguely. But listen, dear. But listen, dear. I want you to turn your back on me for three minutes. Go and sit on the other side of the bed. Don't go too near the window. And don't turn round till I tell you. Winston gazed abstractedly through the muslin curtain. Down in the yard, the red-armed woman was still marching to and fro between the wash tub and the line. She took two more pegs out of her mouth and sang with deep feeling. They sigh that time heals all things. They sigh you can always forget. But the smiles and the tears across the years they twist my heart strings yet. She knew the whole driveling song by heart, it seemed. Her voice floated upward with the sweet summer air, very tuneful, charged with a sort of happy melancholy. One had the feeling that she would have been perfectly content if the June evening had been endless, and the supply of clothes inexhaustible, to remain there for a thousand years, pegging out diapers and singing rubbish. It struck him as a curious fact that he had never heard a member of the party singing alone and spontaneously. It would even have seemed slightly unorthodox, a dangerous eccentricity, like talking to oneself. Perhaps it was only when people were somewhere near the starvation level that they had anything to sing about. You can turn around now, said Julia. He turned round and for a second almost failed to recognise her. What he had actually expected was to see her naked, but she was not naked. The transformation that had happened was much more surprising than that. She had painted her face. She must have slipped into some shop on the proletarian quarters and brought herself a complete set of makeup materials. Her lips were deeply reddened, her cheeks rouged, her nose powdered, there was even a touch of something under the eyes to make them brighter. It was not very skilfully done, but Winston's standards in such matters were not high. He had never before seen or imagined a woman of the party with cosmetics on her face. The improvement in her appearance was startling. With just a few dabs of colour in the right places, she had become not only very much prettier, but above all far more feminine. Her short hair and boyish overalls merely added to the effect. As he took her in his arms, a wave of synthetic violets flooded his nostrils. He remembered the half-darkness of the basement kitchen and a woman's cavernous mouth. It was the very same scent that she had used, but at the moment it did not seem to matter. Scent too, he said. Yes, dear, scent too. And do you know what I'm going to do next? I'm going to get hold of a real woman's frock from somewhere and wear it instead of these bloody trousers. I'll wear silk stockings and high-heeled shoes. In this room, I'm going to be a woman, not a party, comrade. They flung their clothes off and climbed into the huge mahogany bed. It was the first time that he had stripped himself naked in her presence. Until now, he had been too much ashamed of his pale and meagre body, 
with the varicose veins standing out on his calves, and the discoloured patch over his ankle. There were no sheets, but the blanket they lay on was threadbare and smooth, and the size and springiness of the bed astonished both of them. It's sure to be full of bugs, but who cares? said Julia. One never saw a double bed nowadays, except in the homes of the proles. Winston had occasionally slept in one in his boyhood. Julia had never been in one before, so far as she could remember. Presently, they fell asleep for a little while. When Winston woke up, the hands of the clock had crept round to nearly nine. He did not stir, because Julia was sleeping with her head in the crook of his arm. Most of her makeup had transferred itself to his own face or the bolster. But a light stain of rouge still brought out the beauty of her cheekbone. A yellow ray from the sinking sun fell across the foot of the bed and lighted up the fireplace, where the water in the pan was boiling fast. Down in the yard, the woman had stopped singing, but the faint shouts of children floated in from the street. He wondered vaguely whether, in the abolished past, it had been a normal experience to lie in bed like this, in the cool of a summer evening. A man and a woman with no clothes on, making love when they chose, talking of what they chose, not feeling any compulsion to get up, simply lying there and listening to peaceful sounds outside. Surely there could never have been a time when that seemed ordinary. Julia woke up, rubbed her eyes and raised herself on her elbow to look at the oil stove. Half that water's boiled away, she said. I'll get up and make some coffee in another moment. We've got an hour. What time do they cut the lights off at your flats? 23.30. It's 23 at the hostel. But you have to get in earlier than that because... Hi! Get out, you filthy brute! She suddenly twisted herself over in the bed, seized a shoe from the floor, and sent it hurtling into the corner with a boyish jerk of her arm, exactly as he had seen her fling the dictionary at Goldstein that morning during the two-minute hate. What was it? he said in surprise. A rat! I saw him stick his beastly nose out of the wainscoting. There's a hole down there. I gave him a good fright anyway. Rats! murmured Winston. In this room? They're all over the place, said Julia indifferently as she lay down again. We've even got them in the kitchen at the hostel. Some parts of London are swarming with them. Did you know they attack children? Yes, they do. In some of these streets, a woman daren't leave a baby alone for two minutes. It's the great huge brown ones that do it. And the nasty thing is that the brutes always... Don't go on, said Winston, with his eyes tightly shut. Dearest, you've grown quite pale. What's the matter? Do they make you feel sick? Of all the horrors in the world, a rat! She pressed herself against him and wound her limbs round him, as though to reassure him with the warmth of her body. He did not reopen his eyes immediately. For several moments he had had the feeling of being back in a nightmare, which had recurred from time to time throughout his life. It was always very much the same. He was standing in front of a wall of darkness, and on the other side of it there was something unendurable, something too dreadful to be faced. In the dream, his deepest feeling was always one of self-deception, because he did, in fact, know what was behind the wall of darkness. With a deadly effort, like wrenching a piece out of his own brain, he could even have dragged the thing into the open. He always woke up without discovering what it was, but somehow it was connected with what Julia had been saying when he cut her short. I'm sorry, he said. It's nothing. I don't like rats. That's all. Don't worry, dear. We're not going to have the filthy brutes in here. I'll stuff the hole with a bit of sacking before we go. 
then next time we come here, I'll bring some plaster and bung it up properly. Already the black instant of panic was half forgotten. Feeling slightly ashamed of himself, he sat up against the bed head. Julia got out of bed, pulled on her overalls, and made the coffee. The smell that rose from the saucepan was so powerful and exciting that they shut the window lest anybody outside should notice it and become inquisitive. What was even better than the taste of the coffee was the silky texture given to it by the sugar, a thing Winston had almost forgotten after years of saccharine. With one hand in her pocket and a piece of bread and jam in the other, Julia wandered about the room, glancing indifferently at the bookcase, pointing out the best way of repairing the gate-leg table, plumping herself down in the ragged armchair to see if it was comfortable, and examining the absurd twelve-hour clock with a sort of tolerant amusement. She brought the glass paperweight over to the bed to have a look at it in a better light. He took it out of her hand, fascinated, as always, by the soft, rain-watery appearance of the glass. "'What is it, do you think?' said Julia. "'I don't think it's anything. I mean, I don't think it was ever put to any use. That's what I like about it. It's a little chunk of history that they've forgotten to alter. It's a message from a hundred years ago, if one knew how to read it.' "'And that picture over there?' She nodded at the engraving on the opposite wall. Would that be a hundred years old? More. Two hundred, I dare say. One can't tell. It's impossible to discover the age of anything nowadays. She went over to look at it. Here's where that brute stuck his nose out, she said, kicking the wainscoting immediately below the picture. What is this place? I've seen it before somewhere. It's a church, or at least it used to be. St. Clement's Dane, its name was. The fragment of rhyme that Mr. Charrington had taught him came back into his head, and he added, half nostalgically, Oranges and lemons, say the bells of St. Clement's. To his astonishment, she capped the line. You owe me three farthings, say the bells of St. Martin's. When will you pay me? Say the bells of Old Bailey. I can't remember how it goes on after that, but anyway, I remember it ends up, Here comes a candle to light you to bed. Here comes a chopper to chop off your head. It was like the two halves of a countersign. But there must be another line after the bells of Old Bailey. Perhaps it could be dug out of Mr. Charrington's memory, if he were suitably prompted. Who taught you that? he said. My grandfather. He used to say it to me when I was a little girl. He was vaporised when I was eight. At any rate, he disappeared. I wonder what a lemon was, she added inconsequently. I've seen oranges. They're a kind of round yellow fruit with a thick skin. I can remember lemons, said Winston. They were quite common in the fifties. They were so sour that it set your teeth on edge, even to smell them. I bet that picture's got bugs behind it, said Julia. I'll take it down and give it a good clean some day. I suppose it's almost time we were leaving. I must start washing this paint off. What a bore. I'll get the lipstick off your face afterwards. Winston did not get up. The room was darkening. He turned over towards the light and lay gazing into the glass paperweight. The inexhaustibly interesting thing was not the fragment of coral, but the interior of the glass itself. There was such depth of it, and yet it was almost as transparent as air. It was as though the surface of the glass had been the arch of the sky, enclosing a tiny world with its atmosphere complete. He had the feeling that he could get inside it, and that in fact he was inside it, along with the mahogany bed, and the gate leg table, and the clock, and the steel engraving, and the paperweight itself. The paperweight was the room he was in.
and the coral was Julia's life and his own, fixed in a sort of eternity at the heart of the crystal.